Well, good morning, church. We're continuing in our study of 1 Corinthians, and we return for a second week to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll be considering the first 15 verses for a second time. So I invite you and encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we'll be looking again at verses 1 through 15. If you have found your way there, would you join me as we stand together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Paul writing to the Corinthians, verse 1, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave things, evil things, as they also craved. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Verse 8, nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Verse 9, nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. Verse 10, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, again, we're so grateful for this Lord's Day, the first day of the week, the day that we have gathered together commemorating the day that Jesus conquered sin and death in our behalf. Father, we thank you for being yours, for knowing you. Thank you for all the benefits that are ours by faith in Christ. Forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the saints, and the promise of everlasting life. Father, as your people, we are trying to make it from point A to point B, point B being the promised land. We pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom of understanding as we look into your word this morning. We pray that we would have eyes that see and ears that hear, hearts to believe that we might make it. And we pray, Lord, for the one who preaches his sins are many. We pray that you would hide him in the shadow of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we pray again this morning that we would not just be challenged but changed, not just confronted but conformed to the image of our Savior. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. Last week, we began considering these very important verses, and I introduced the idea of the distinction between the assurance of salvation and assumption of salvation, a very, very important distinction. Paul is both the apostle of the assurance of salvation, and yet the warner of the dangers of assumption of salvation. Again, the assurance of salvation is first of all based upon the promises of God. The promises of God are certain. It is first based upon the promises of God and second, it is based upon right responses to the promises of God. Concerning the assurance of salvation, we can be assured that all that God has promised is certain. And further, when we respond to those promises rightly, we can be assured that those promises are certain for us. On the other hand, Paul warns about the dangers of assumption of salvation. The assumption of salvation involves our own assumed salvation. 
usually based upon our own deeds and usually completely apart from right responses to the promises of God. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is warning the Corinthian believers about the dangers of assumption. And as we saw last week, I'll remind you that his warning is drawn from history, from the Old Testament, from our spiritual ancestors. Those Exodus Israelites, whom 14 years earlier to Paul writing to the Corinthians, experienced, like the Corinthians, a deliverance from God. They were delivered from the bonds of Egypt, from captivity, from the servitude of slavery, all of which in the Old Testament precipitated the Christian's deliverance. The deliverance from the bondage of sin, the enslavement of sin, from the law of sin and death, from captivity. And Paul's point in this text is that their experience was strikingly similar to the Corinthians 1,400 years later, or even to our own experience 3,400 years later. God had endowed them as he did the Corinthians and as he does us with extraordinary spiritual realities. They were means of grace that God gave them, God gave the Corinthians, and God gives us in order to strengthen and to provoke right responses to the promises of God. A quick review, look again at verses 1 through 4. Speaking about these Exodus Israelites, Paul writes, verse 1, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, writing to the Corinthians, 1,400 years later, that our fathers, they were our spiritual ancestors, were all under the cloud and passed through the sea. This refers to the presence of God. As they journeyed to the promised land, God went before them. God was with them in a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. God was with them as he led them to the promised land as... God is with the Corinthians, and God is with us, leading us not to Canaan, but to heaven. Verse 2, again, similar, and they were all baptized into Moses, in the cloud, and in the sea. This refers to the parting of the Red Sea, which Paul sees as an Old Testament type of baptism. They were baptized in the name of a mediator, which in the Old Testament was Moses, and in the New Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ. They just like the Corinthians, just like us, baptism and a mediator. You'll notice verse 3, And they all ate of the same spiritual food and all drank of the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from the spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Here Paul is referring to the Exodus Israelites and God providing them manna and water, and Paul sees this as a type, a type of the Lord's table. They ate and drank of the Lord just like the Corinthians did. And just like we do. And so Paul's point is these Exodus Israelites experienced very much the same thing as the Corinthians did and as we do. And this is where we left off last week. Verse 5, again, nevertheless, here is the warning. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. That means, that refers to the fact that that first generation, delivered from Egypt, heading to the promised land, never made it there. They all, with the exception of two people, Caleb and Joshua, died in the wilderness. And it wasn't until the second generation of wilderness wanderers Uh, they were to experience the promised land. And again, verse 6, now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. And again, verse 7, do not be idolaters, one. Two, verse 8, do not act immorally. Three, verse 9, do not try the Lord. And four, verse 10, do not grumble. Four sins identified. Do not be idolaters, do not act immorally, do not try the Lord, and do not grumble. Do not grumble. Four sins, four types of sins committed against God by the Exodus Israelites, some which were committed on multiple occasions, all of which became the cause for non-entrance, failure to enter the promised land. The object of God's judgment, four sins, idolatry, verse 7, Morality, verse 8, trying the Lord, verse 9, grumbling, 
verse 10. It is these four sins and the consequence of these sins that Paul intends to serve as an example to the Corinthians and certainly to us. Negative examples. Again, verse 6, these things happened as examples for us. Verse 11, now these things happened for them as an example and they were written for our instruction. Powerful negative examples for the Corinthians and for us. So this morning I'm going to take a minute and I want us to think carefully about these sins. Four sins that kept God's people. Mediator, yes. Baptism, yes. Lord's table, yes. Presence of God, yes. Yet, four sins that prevented them from entering the promised land. The first sin listed is idolatry. It's in verse 7. Look at it. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. This sin of idolatry is further emphasized in verse 14, where Paul simply says, Therefore, my beloved, flee, flee idolatry. And so here's the point. Despite all those means of grace that we just identified, despite all that they had witnessed from the hand of God in the Exodus, despite all that God had commanded them, when they had an opportunity, they immediately returned to the idolatry of Egypt. How can that be? Romans 1, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks, but became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images. Images. This morning, I want to ask you a favor. Mark, if you would, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll return there. And look with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus. We want to consider, consider several passages from Exodus. The first place I would take you is to Exodus chapter 32, where we find the account of this sin of idolatry being committed by the Exodus Israelites. Exodus chapter 32, we'll look at verses 1 and following. Verse 1, now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, here they are exiled through the Red Sea, on their way in the wilderness journeys, camped out at the foot of Sinai. God calls Moses atop of Sinai, covers the mountain in his glory, and Israel sits at the foot of Sinai, the mountain covered in glory, and Moses is delayed. Again, now when the people saw Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off your gold rings, which are on your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and they took from this their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose up early, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Go down at once, for your people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them, and they have made for themselves a molten calf, and I have, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So, while Moses is delayed with God atop of Sinai, and we'll get to the cause of that delay in just a minute, but as Moses delayed, the people turned immediately back to idolatry. The golden calf was an Egyptian god, and not only did they create a pagan idol, but the people of God, Israel, worshipped that pagan idol as pagans worship pagan idols. You'll notice at the end of verse 6, it says that they sat down to eat and drink. This would have been a pagan feast, and they rose up to play. This would have been pagan immorality, 
always associated with idolatry. A pagan feast followed by pagan immorality and the worship of a pagan idol claiming that this idol is their god. All of this, again, took place while Moses was delayed atop of Mount Sinai meeting with God. In fact, the last time that they had seen Moses is when Moses came down and delivered to them the Ten Commandments. And so from Exodus chapter 32, look at Exodus chapter 20 with me. In Exodus 20, the last time they would have seen Moses prior to the golden calf, Moses comes down and repeats to them all that God had said to them. And in Exodus 20, what do we have before us? We have what we typically refer to as what? The Ten Commandments. Verse 1, Then the Lord God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods, finish that with me, before me. Now I want us to pause there for a minute. The word before there, translated in English before, is a Hebrew conjunction or Hebrew preposition depending on how it is used. It is the Hebrew word all. The word there, all, or translated before, doesn't refer to sequence. Thou shall have no other gods before me has nothing to do with sequence. The word all there has nothing to do with sequence. It primarily refers to proximity. Thou, have, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The word all means upon, in, on, over, by, against, or beside. You shall have no other gods upon, in, on, over, by, against, or beside. Verse 4, look at it. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. That's the entire universe, by the way. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon their children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love and kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. According to God, idolatry is having any God, having anything upon, in, on, over, by, against, or beside God. According to God, idolatry is placing, listen to this, any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth, upon, in, on, by, over, against, or beside God. This is a comprehensive restriction. No likeness of any kind from anywhere to be found. I believe that one of the most integral things a pastor can do is to explain. And so allow me for a brief moment to take an excursus for the purpose of explaining. And I want to say this is not an argument, this is not confrontational, this is simply an explanation. And I'm actually very grateful for those who made me aware of the fact that I need to make this explanation. The explanation is one that you may agree with and it may be one that you're uh, in disagreement with, and you're free to agree or disagree. Again, this is just simply an explanation. And it deals with our worship center or our sanctuary. Okay? Uh, people have noted that there is no cross in this room. People have noticed that there are no icons in this room. No crucifixes in this room. No American flag, no Christian flag, no liturgical symbols, none of that. And I need to say that their absence is not an oversight. Gee, we forgot. Their absence is intentional. Their absence, by the way, is not a statement about the importance of the cross, the enormous significance of the cross. And I would hope that if you've been coming to grace for any amount of time, you know that I believe in the cross. 
and would hope that I would be, if not foremost, certainly on the top of the heap of preachers who preach the cross. Their absence isn't a statement about America. Their absence isn't in any way related to all the nonsense that happens to be going on right now in our country. Their absence has nothing to do with people refusing to stand for the national anthem or people burning the American flag or tearing down national monuments. All these things are abhorrent to me and to our elders. The absence of these things is in obedience to the word of God and the belief that idolatry is placing anything any likeness upon, in, on, by, over, against, and beside God. Placing any likeness of what is in heaven above, on earth below, or beneath the earth, the entire universe, any likeness in the universe, upon, in, on, over, by, against, or beside God. Now I need to be clear so that you don't misquote me. I am not saying that a cross is an idol. And I am not saying the American flag is an idol. But I am saying that they are likenesses that do not belong upon, in, on, over, by, against, or besides God. Any likeness in the universe do not belong next to God. Our intention is that this sanctuary, this worship center, whatever would be a place solely and only singularly and exclusively committed to the glory and worship of the invisible God alone. You can disagree. You're free to. It's simply an explanation. And by the way, what's striking about the Ten Commandments, chapter 20, and then the creation of the calf in chapter 32, why is Moses delayed? He's delayed because God is instructing Moses how his tabernacle, his sanctuary, is to be created. If you were to begin, for instance, in uh, chapter 25 and all the way to the, to the creation of the golden calf for seven chapters, instruction upon instruction upon instruction as to how the temple, how the tabernacle was to be created given by God to Moses specifically. And by the way, throughout it, there is indication that the tabernacle is actually being created in such a way that it is a earthly replication of the heavenly tabernacle of God in heaven. Heaven in modicum, in miniature, has come to earth. And God says, therefore, it has to be just like this. Everybody say amen. Um, and by the way, the primary features in the tabernacle were pieces of furniture, a laver, a large bowl filled with water for purification and cleansing, a table with bread, the bread of God, and a large box that held the word of God, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod and the bowls of manna. In this room, we have tempted to replicate that in New Covenant setting. The baptistry, the bowl of water, the table of bread, the Lord's table, and the pulpit where the word of God is preached without images and likenesses. And by the way, when we bought these pieces, we tried to buy the most oversized pieces we could get in order to emphasize their significance. Again, you may disagree, it's just an explanation. By the way, the only exceptions in the original tank sanctuary were these. There were two angels mounted to the Ark of the Covenant. And there was one menorah, one candlestick, fashioned in the form of an almond tree. What do they symbolize? They symbolize the original, the first sanctuary, the Garden of Eden, where God stationed two angels to protect his holiness from fallen man and to oversee his presence in an almond tree which symbolized the garden. And those two things were woven throughout the curtains of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the sanctuary, the original tabernacle. Again, this room is not created to be a stage. It's not dark stage lighting. It's light. You look out and what do you see? Garden. You see trees and, and grass and one day plants and all of that when we get the money <laughs> and can landscape it. And you look out this window and you see trees and 
let's call it a bumper crop. <laughs> but that's the way it was designed. Designed. Windows. Again, you can agree but disagree. It is a commitment on our part, as we see it, to be faithful and to flee in any way the context of idolatry. Do I love America? You bet I do. And even, you know, thinking to myself, we'll even put an American flag and a Christian flag in the sanctuary. But in this place, it's sola dia gloria. God alone. Is the image of God in this room? Yeah, look at the person next to you, right? You were created in the image and likeness of who? God. But further than that, idolatry, that is placing anything upon, in, on, over, by, against, or beside God, can take place apart from a sanctuary, apart from the worship of God. It can take place in your heart. It can take place in your life. Not only is this room a sanctuary, but according to God's word, so are we. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And for each and every one of us, I would hope that our, our desire should be that our lives would be as sensitive to idolatry as we've attempted to be in this room. J.C. Ryle says this, and he's spot on. He says, quote, idolatry is a worship in which the honor due to God in Trinity and him only is given to some of his creatures or to some invention of his creatures. He writes, it may vary exceedingly. It may assume exceedingly different forms according to either the ignorance or the knowledge to the civilization or barbarism of those who offer it. It may be grossly absurd and ludicrous or it may be closer to truth and admit to being defended. But whether in the adoration of an idol of a juggernaut or the adoration of the host in St. Peter's at Rome, the principle of idolatry is in the same reality. In either case, the honor due God is turned ahead of him and bestowed on that which is not God. And whenever this is done in a heathen temple or professedly Christian churches, there is an act of idolatry. It is not necessary for a man to formally deny God or Christ in order to be an idolater far from it. Professed reverence for God of the Bible and actual idolatry are perfectly compatible and have often gone side by side and still do to this day, end quote. Idolatry is when any honor due only to God is given to something other than God. And Paul says, therefore, flee idolatry. The second sin, in verse 8, nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. This refers to the events in Numbers 25, which says, While Israel, that's the first generation of wilderness wanderers, remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Verse 3 says that the Lord was angry against them. Verse 4, four speaks of the fierce anger of the Lord. And verse 9 speaks of those who died being 24,000. Let us not act immorally. Pornuo. That's any kind of sexual sin. We live in a sexually sinful, explicitly sinful culture right now where sexual sin has gone places that most of us never could even have imagined 20 years ago. Again, the only sexual activity that is not immorality or pornuo is, the, is uh, intimacy between a husband and wife, a man married to a woman, that's it. And we have talked about this at length as we've made our way through Corinthians. Thirdly, third sin listed, trying the Lord. Notice verse 9. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. And this refers to the events in Numbers 21, uh, when the Exodus Israelites tried, as it were, the Lord's patience. Patience. And God, in anger, sent judgment in the form of serpents. They found themselves in a land filled with vipers, deadly. Why? Because they tried the Lord. You know what trying the Lord is? Trying the Lord is repetitive sin. Pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing. Pressing. The idea of trying God's patience. God's patience. I remember not too long ago I was at Walmart and there was a poor mom with little kids and 
not very well disciplined kids. And as she's trying to get the groceries on the conveyor belt, these kids are grabbing from the candy aisle there, you know, and they're just thrown into the car and she'd say, stop and put it back. And, you know, and this just kept going on and on and on. And it was like, I'm never going to get through this cashier, you know. And, and at some point, I just watched this disobedience and trying and try. I, said, I said, lady, you want me to help? You want me to take care of this for you real quick? <laughs> trying the Lord. Years ago, I remember a little bracelet had the letters P, B, P, G, I, N, F, W, M, Y. Remember that? An acronym? Please be patient. God's not finished with me yet. God is patient, isn't he? God is patient, and by the way, I'm not. I am learning patience. While God is perfectly patient, I am working on it. I want to remind you of something. Here's, here is a Christian worldview. You ready? In our twisted world, where dark has been substituted with light and evil has been called good and sin against God is considered to be a personal freedom. So far, if anything, you and I have been firsthand witnesses to the patience of God. A kind of patience that is beyond my imagination. Isaiah 48, 9, for the sake of my name, I delay my wrath and my praise, and for it, I restrain it from you in order to not cut you off. Our lost world, and even us as Christians, can be tempted to interpret the impatience of God as God's indifference, God's acceptance, God's absence. What we witness right now at this very moment is the patience of God. And God's patience is given in order for the opportunity of repentance. But the patience of God will run out. Why is God patient? Here's why. Real simple. Why is God patient? Because judgment will come. And it will come inevitably. In fact, the story of the Bible is that judgment always comes when the patience of God runs out. And to make no mistake about it, the judgment of God will come on our nation. You can count on it. It will come on all the nations. It will come on our entire world. St. Augustine said, quote, God has promised forgiveness to your repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow for your procrastination, end quote. 2 Peter 3, 8, do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but all come to repentance. Having said that, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come. His patience will end, and it will end like a thief, unexpected, unanticipated in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be stored with intense heat and the earth burned up with all of its works. <clears throat> God is patient, but his patience is not everlasting. It will end. They pressed and they pressed and they pressed and they pressed and they pressed God and judgment came. The fourth sin, grumbling. Verse 10 nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. The Exodus Israelites were grumblers. Grumblers. They grumbled about the water. They grumbled about the food. They grumbled when God provided manna. They grumbled when God provided water. They grumbled about the enemies. They grumbled about the promised land. They grumbled about Moses. They grumbled about Aaron. They grumbled about God. They grumbled about the journey. It says even they grumbled in their tents. They grumbled about grumbling. Just grumbled. What is grumbling? Grumbling is the verbalization of discontentment. And often, grumbling is the ver verbalization of discontentment with the objective of spreading discontentment. 
John Beeson, Gospel Coalition, says grumbling is whispered rebellion. In the book of James, chapter 5, 9, it says, Do not grumble, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves will not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. That's the book of James. Now, in the book of Jacob's, chapter 1, verse 1, says this, The humble don't grumble. Or verse 2, the grumble will stumble, fumble, and crumble. We don't prosper when we grumble, do we? We don't prosper. You don't prosper. You infect the people around you. You don't help the whole. They grumbled against God. And you know what? God got fed up. Fed up with their grumbling. So fed up, they didn't enter the promised land. And you might say, well, these things are bad idolatry, immorality, trying the Lord, grumbling. They're bad, and it's bad for them. It's too bad what happened to them, but it doesn't pertain to me. To which verse 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks they stand take heed lest they fall. There's not one of us in this room that aren't capable of idolatry, immorality, trying God, or grumbling. Verse 13a, no no temptation overtake you that is not as common to man. You get that. This is all common to fallen man. It is in our depravity and our Adamic nature as fallen sons and daughters of Adam in our fallen nature. Our fallen nature is drawn to these sins and drawn to a million other sins. Stop grumbling. Deliver us from evil. I find it amazing when, as we read this morning and cited together a corporate prayer, the Lord's Prayer from Matthew 6 and Luke 11, that Jesus places our request for daily bread right alongside the need for deliverance from temptation and evil. Daily, moment by moment, we all are so capable at any drop of the hat. Again, verse 13, such an important passage. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you'll be able to endure it. How many of you, just by show of hand, are familiar with this verse? We kind of cling to it, don't we? Let me suggest something to you that you may or may have never thought about, that actually, uh, in light of the context, uh, Paul is really painting before the Corinthians a scene, a scene. The phrase, a way of escape, in the Greek text refers to a a mountain pass or a or a ravine, escape ravine in a desert canyon, an escape route. We've all seen that in Westerns, right, where you got a way of escape. The phrase has overtaken you is the idea of a threatening army that is encroaching you, that is catching up to you. And the phrase able to endure it means that your escape is going to be a struggle. It's going to be flight. The scene that I believe is being described here is very, would have been very familiar in the context of the Exodus Israelites. You remember Exodus 14? Let me just read and remind it, remind you of it. Verse 5, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart towards the people. And they said, what is this we have done? We have let Israel go from serving us. Verse 6, so he made his chariots ready and took his people with him. And he took 600 select chariots and, and all the other chariots of Egypt with the officers over them all. Verse 9, and the Egyptians chased after them with all their horses and chariots and Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army. And listen to this, verse 9, and they, here it is, overtook them. Verse 10, as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching upon them and they became very frightened. Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the Lord swept back the sea by strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land so the waters were divided. And the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land and the waters were like a wall on them on the right hand and on their left. No temptation has overtaken you but is such common to man but God is faithful who with a temptation will provide a way of escape 
so that you will be able to endure it, to flee it, to make flight through it. What do we learn, just looking at verse 13, what do we learn about temptation? First of all, no one's immune to it. Common to man. When you're tempted, your temptation is not unique to yourself. But we also see in verse 13 that when we are tempted, we are not alone in our temptation. God is there. The real crucible of escaping temptation isn't the way through the pass. Ready for this? Where the real crucible lies is the actual desire to escape the temptation. That's the temptation. The real temptation is the desire to escape the temptation. And with the real desire to escape the temptation, God will make a way. That's the promise. See, the problem, as James says, is let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt with evil, nor is he himself tempted by no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and and enticed by his own desire innately. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. When we are tempted, don't blame God. Don't trust in yourself. But seek God to create in you a desire to escape the temptation. And with the desire to escape the temptation, guess what? God will always provide a way of escape. Any questions? Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we're so grateful for your your patience, first of all. So grateful for your patience with us as individuals our stumblings and our failings, our shortcomings, our compromises. But Father, teach us, teach us to be like Jesus. Teach us to love what Jesus loved and to hate what Jesus hates. And when we are tempted with that which Jesus hates, help us, Lord, to hate it ourselves or to love it ourselves. Help us, Lord, to desire to flee temptation, knowing that you are always God, faithful God, who doesn't tempt us beyond that which we're able to endure, but always provides a way of escape. Father, we thank you for the example that's been set before us and the great warning between the assurance of salvation, the promises of God, and the right response to those promises, as opposed to the assumption of salvation, on our own goodness, our own self-righteousness, our own abilities, our own actions, apart from the promises of God. Father, looking at this example, it is striking. In so many ways, they're just like us. And yet, they didn't enter in. Father, we treat Christianity often, the gospel, and our salvation, and the cross with such a cavalier, Uh, We treat it uh, as if it's common and profane. When throughout the scriptures, we're taught uh, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, we have assurance, but no, we cannot take it for granted. We must pursue Christ and flee idolatry. Father, even as I'm praying this prayer, I'm thinking the whole context where people are asking, can we eat the meat? And he says, well, it's not a simple answer, but yet he comes down to it and says, don't even come close to it. Don't even, don't even come to the edges of anything that would be sin and separate your faith and trust in God alone. Flee it. Flee it, just like that mountain pass. Flee through it. And so, Father, I would pray for myself, pray for each person in this room, particularly someone who's really struggling with temptation, maybe is failing often to the same temptation, who is trying God's patience with the failing of the same temptations. Lord, we look to you and ask, God, that the Holy Spirit, your word, our conscience, would grieve us in such a way and empower us in such a way and enable us in such a way that we would begin 
to desire to flee sin and look to you to provide that faithful and sure retreat from it. We want to be a holy people, a holy church. We don't want to play games with you. Uh, We know that uh, the promised land is on the horizon. It's on the immediate horizon. Heaven and earth is, in fact, passing away, and tomorrow we will be one day closer to that day when Jesus Christ comes as a thief in the night. Yes, you are patient, but that day will come. Again, we just pray for your grace in our lives. We thank you for your promises that are ours. Help us to respond to those promises rightly. Help us not to try you. The sins that have occupied and characterized our lives year after year as if the cross is of no avail and there's no power and we'd let this go and let that go and grumble and complain our mouths or attitudes. Um, Help us to not insult the God of grace and provision. And so we commit ourselves to you, Father, and we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Would you join me as we stand together for the benediction? My brothers and sisters, according to God's word, this benediction is at yours. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.